I'll just quickly go over just my rough setup because um, I probably don't have to repeat that. So I've basically just got, as usual, if you've watched any of my videos before, my um, reference is up on just a little iPad there. Hopefully you guys have your references up sort of next to where I'm working um, so that you can see what I'm doing and work from your reference at the same time. The reference I chose for this workshop is actually a painting rather than a, a photo. Um, just because it's got a really nice, quite striking um, shadow pattern, which is good to work from. And to a certain extent, it's interesting when doing something like a wash drawing for the first time um, to use an artist that would have used the same method. So the way this painting would have been built up. Um, so it's a painting by Carlos Duran, who was a sort of academic painter from the 19th century. He was quite famous as a teacher. Um, the way that he built it up will be similar to what we're doing today. Probably one difference might have been the original painting would have um, probably used more of a burnt umber or raw umber ground rather than um, this yellow ochre ground. Um, but if you use a yellow ochre ground, you'll just get kind of brighter um, sort of tones showing through um, the features, which probably would give it a slightly more contemporary look versus a 19th century painting like this. Um, I'll start going through my materials now. So first things first, I've got my little panel. So this is just a handmade panel. It's actually a, on the back of an, another painting, another sketch. I'm just going to admit Deborah. So that's our last person. So I'll just switch everyone's audio off as well. Yeah, so my panel is just a piece of um, sort of like MDF plywood. So it's sort of like MDF back plywood from Jackson's art. And I've just prepared it with some gesso myself and then with a tone of yellow ochre. Um, if you did prepare, you prepare your panel to paint on, you don't have to, you can just work with a white panel for this workshop. It doesn't matter too much. Um, I'll actually talk a little bit about that later because there's a way that you can um, sort of work around not having a tone when you're doing a wash drawing, which is actually quite a useful thing about wash drawing as your first sort of layer. Um, but yeah, basically mine's just prepared with a, a yellow ochre tone, um, over gesso, just sanded down gesso, but you can use a canvas. You could use a panel. Anything really is totally fine, um, for this process. I then got my palette up next to my panel. Um, you don't have to do that. You can obviously hold your palette wherever is comfortable for you, or you can have a table palette, anything really, but it's useful. I like for the video courses, I like to have my, my palette visible so that you can see what I'm doing and what I'm mixing. It's not going to be super complex what I'm mixing today because we're just using burnt umber for a wash drawing. Um, but even so, it's kind of useful to see how much medium I use and that sort of thing. My medium cups are just here, so I'll just be putting my, my solvent into there. Um, and then I'm just going to swivel my camera around a bit. Drop that down. And just go through the brushes that I've selected. I'm just going to get my video camera controller just to focus a bit better. I might go in a bit closer. So I've got these three, um, but you can use pretty much any selection of brushes that you're comfortable with. Roughly this sort of size is good. So that's going to like half my thumb size the, for the bigger brush, about half that for my smaller bristle. One's a long bristle. So that's a bit of a kind of like semi, semi stiff brush. This one's quite a stiff brush, the little one, which is quite good for loading kind of thicker bits of paint. And then the last brush I have is this sort of soft springy little round, uh, synthetic round. Um, but that's all I'm going to be using. We don't really have to worry too much about cleaning brushes for this workshop because the, the paint is just all burnt umber. So you're either going to have more burnt umber or less burnt umber as you work. Um, but you're not going to get kind of like mixing or sort of tainting colors like you might do if you had a, a palette that had multiple colors. So those are the brushes I'm using. But as I say, pretty much anything is, is workable for this um, this workshop in terms of brushes that you have. I've then got a very important thing, which is just my burnt umber paint. Um, if you're not using burnt umber, so sometimes people have like burnt sienna or some other sort of brownish color, even a black, in theory, you could do your wash drawing with any paint color. You don't have to use burnt umber, but, um, ideally for like the yellow ochre ground and as a basis for a, a portrait painting, burnt umber is a good choice. The main reason being that burnt umber is a good sort of um, 
basis for a shadow. So when you're kind of glazing and laying your shadows over the top of you are to continue a painting after the wash drawing stage. Obviously we're just going to be stopping at the wash drawing today. Um, the burnt umber generally is a pretty good um, base shadow tone for flesh tones. Um, just straight out the tube is a really useful paint. I do have um, a palette knife. We likely won't be using it. I don't think our palette knife, but sometimes if you need to scrape back, like if you've loaded too much paint on the surface, it, it can be handy to have. Um, I've then got just some odorless solvent from Jackson's. Um, so yeah, that's basically just a low odor solvent. So it's usually best to use the low odor, most low odor possible that you can, because it's less, it's not non-toxic, but it's less toxic. Um, and finally, I've just got a few little pads of um, sort of paper towel to clean my brushes on. It's partly to clean brushes, but we can also, we'll be using it a little bit to kind of wipe back on the surface, um, which kind of leads us on to what a wash drawing is. Um, it's going to tilt back up here. Just get my focus back in. So wash drawing sounds a bit like an oxymoron, but basically, the principle of it is that we're trying to I'm just going to focus this in there. So we're trying to create a basically a drawing underneath the 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 painting over the top. Um, so it's not we are painting, but the the kind of thought process behind a wash drawing is a bit more like drawing than it's like painting. So when we're painting, um, sort of specifically painting type techniques are things like glazing or scumbling. Um, where we're using kind of very thin building up of layers, or if we're doing kind of impastos, like direct painting that's very thick and has a lot of body, so there's sort of physicality to the paint. Um, those are painting techniques. Generally working with color is sort of what, something that you would associate with painting. So with this wash drawing, it's gonna be monochrome. Um, and in a way that's, that's quite drawing based as well. Um, traditionally drawing is seen as the drawing aspects of a painting are seen as the parts of the painting that are more sort of structural and more value based. So rather than being about color, um, so the lustrousness of the color or the specific individual colors, it's more about the relationship between values. Um, so a lot of people in traditional painting kind of think of painting, the most important aspects of painting as being drawing because those sort of black and white aspects, the value-based things are what tend to strike the viewer first. Um, one theory for this is that we have more um, rods than cones in our eyes. So we tend to respond more viscerally to value than we do to color. Um, and color is sort of in a, a traditional way is seen as a sort of something you put over the top of value, which is not necessarily something I agree with, but it's um, sort of the general principle behind uh, academic painting traditionally. So the wash aspect of a wash drawing is the um, the use of medium um, with the paint. So we're not kind of painting the, the paint on straight out of the tube. We're going to be using a lot of medium um, to keep things quite thin and gradually build up um, darkness in the wash painting. Wash paintings are by nature quite loose, so you can shift them around a lot. They're kind of more forgiving, I'd say, than almost anything that you can do. So they're more forgiving than charcoal drawing, uh, more forgiving than pencil drawing, in that if you don't like something, we can just wipe it straight off with some more medium because the oil paint doesn't dry. It might stain a tiny bit, but it pretty much doesn't dry for the, the time period that we're working, so it's extremely flexible. Um, in that way, it's actually easier than, I would consider it easier than something like watercolor or even acrylics. Um, because of its flexibility in terms of being able to be wiped back. It can seem difficult because it doesn't dry, but I would say in a lot of ways that actually makes oil painting easier. Um, it gives you longer to work on a, on a stage than you would get with something like watercolor where you really have to sort of nail it when you first lay it down. It's more difficult to make corrections. Um, so start by putting this a new, new tin of solvent. So I'm just going to pop a little, actually, a little bit of green paint, I think, left over in that, that left hand pot. So I'm just going to reach around, try not to spill too much, put some medium in that 
right hand side. And just pop out my burnt umber. So it's a pretty straightforward palette setup today. It's not complex. So kind of like a little, about that much. Burnt umber is probably going to be enough, you know, a sort of, I don't quite know how to describe it, but what I would consider a normal amount of paint to squeeze out of a tube. Um, I recommend holding, generally it's kind of good to hold your, your paper towel in one hand while you're working, particularly for this sort of, um, this stage of the piece where we might be using the paper towel quite a lot. So whichever hand, whether you're left hand or right handed, hold it in your opposite hand. If you're holding a palette, um, you can actually hold, if you imagine your thumb slipped through the little hole in the palette here, you can sort of hold on to your paper towel with the palette at the same time, which is useful as well, because it means you don't have to put your palette down to grab your paper towel. And then I want you to take, so we're going to start with our largest brush and we're going to start fairly loosely and with quite thin paint. So the general approach of this um, session will be to gradually use less medium and more sort of thick paint. So viscous paint out of the tube. And we'll also gradually be using sort of mostly um, smaller brushes. But the main thing that is going to make the value lighter or darker, we have no variables apart from burnt umber. That's our paint. So the value is either going to be lighter or darker, depending on how much, um, how thinly placed this burnt umber is over the surface of the painting. So if I was to, for instance, take a thick amount of it and whack it there, that's about as dark as the burnt umber is going to go. So that's placing kind of straight paint out of the tube really thickly onto the, the surface of the painting there. If I was to take a lot of medium, sort of wash it, almost like I'm cleaning my brush, and then paint another little patch next to it, that's sort of like the minimum amount that we could place on the surface to the extent that it's starting to drip down. Um, so I'm just going to zoom in a little bit as much as I can without tilting. So you can sort of see the difference in value. So we can control value by using more or less medium mixed into our paint. And you can see this is where the sort of wash the washiness comes from in the description. So it's going to be quite washy. So if you like, you can have a little go. So before we even start painting, just kind of get used to picking up paint, laying it on the surface, um, trying out sort of lots of medium mixed in or not much medium mixed in at all, and just see how it feels to move it around. In terms of how you hold the brush, I'll just zoom back out again now. <clears throat> So you want to hold the brush as far back as possible. So you'll see that you can't even see my hand when I paint. Um, that's because I'm actually holding it like this right at the back, kind of like almost like a chopstick. Um, what that encourages me to do is not be too, um, not put too much pressure on the painting. It's a bit like when, when I work in charcoal, if you've done any of my charcoal workshops, if I was pressing right up here, I just, um, there's more of a tendency to kind of press a bit too hard. It's hard to really control how, uh, how light your stroke is. Whereas back here, you know, you can do really, really fine little strokes. You can do heavy strokes as well, but it just gives you a bit more variation in terms of control. So the other thing we're going to be doing today when we want to change things, as I've alluded to, is I'm just going to tear my paper in half. If I take a little bit of my, um, just swirl this around slightly as well, so you can see, take a little bit of my medium, dip it into my, my palette cup, and then I can just wipe back what I've painted. Pretty, pretty much all of this, barring maybe that really thick little bit that I wiped, can just be removed from the surface of the painting. As I said, it's not probably going to come completely off, but I'm going to be able to, to clean it to a reasonable degree. If I kept going, I'd probably be able to remove all of that paint. But that basically allows me to just totally erase whatever I'm working on or anything that I need to erase. So how I want you to look at it is everything can be corrected at this stage. And there's only one variable is just the, the burnt umber. So this is why it's a useful way to start a painting because you're, you're immediately working in paint. We're not going to be doing any underdrawing and anything like charcoal or pencil. 
Um, but it's a very forgiving way to work in paint. If you don't like it, you can just wipe the whole thing back. It's almost like a slate. You can wipe it back as much as you like. Um, I don't recommend doing that too much because sometimes people go a bit overzealous with their, their wiping back of things. Um, it's better to kind of try to build up what you have and keep correcting with what you have. So having rambled on for quite a bit, we'll get started. In my video so you can check how it looks. <clears throat> so as I said, we're using the bigger brush and this kind of like washiness of paint that I have on here now looks all right. Um, you want it to be sort of like semi-transparent, airing more on the side of being quite washy. Um, so if I pop a stroke on the surface, kind of like about that washiness. Um, and what I want to do is we want to start by trying to roughly block in um, the overall proportions of the head. So we're thinking about um, the tilt of the head. If you've done um, portrait drawing workshops with me, we're just transferring over the exact same principles. So we're going to try to create an envelope of the outside of the head, place it in the, the panel, and then start to find the kind of the major features and start to block in shadows. It's exactly the same process. So first thing I want to think about, I can kind of, if you imagine sort of hovering your brush over the surface of the, the image, your reference. Just swivel this a little bit to the right. <clears throat> so you imagine kind of like skimming your, your brush over. It's gonna be running sort of this sort of angle. It's not flat. If I was doing it flat, it'd be like this, but the tilt of the head is about there. So I wanna think about that as I start to sort of block in the top of the head. So I can put a little bit of a note for the, where I want the top of the head to be. And then a little bit of a note for where the beard is going to be. And that's going to be the overall height. If I want to change that, all we need to do is take paper towel and I could drop that down. Let's like make it a little bit bigger. So the chin's going to be just a little bit lower. I'm going to wipe this as well because it's possibly going to be distracting. But it's almost like a whiteboard. You can see it's really easy to change stuff. So that's the, the top of the head there. I then want to think about where is the side of the head going to be? Um, the hair sticks out quite far from the side of the head. So I'm going to, in this instance, just put a line in roughly where I think the side of the head is going to be. It can be a fairly kind of like smudgy line at this stage. We're going to be working over as the paint, the paint will dry gradually. And as the paint dries, particularly the thinner layers of paint, They'll go quite transparent. Um, so we're going to, that's also an advantage of sort of working this way. And then, so that seems roughly the right tilt. So again, I'm thinking about the tilt, the angle of the head. Then opposite that, we've got the side of the head there and the ear. The hair roughly sort of blocking over that. Now the hair is a very sort of like sticks out quite a lot at the sides. So let's sort of start suggesting that. That's not too bad. I'm going to put a little sort of a note in for his shoulder there. And then a little bit of a shape for the bottom of the ear. The color wraps around and then where that drops down, something like that. Now, the next thing I want to get in is the fringe. Some of the hair up there. So this is our approximate envelope for the outside of the head. And I want to stop here for a moment. Um, and I want to think about how the proportions roughly look. Because I feel like as I'm working, maybe I'm going a little bit wide with mine. 
Um, so I want you to just have a look at yours. Um, so take a moment, sort of a break, stop the painting and, and have a look. Flick your eye between your reference and your, your painting and see if you feel like there's any significant differences. So do that for like a, about a sort of half a minute, minute or so I'll give you just to sort of sit and think about it a bit. So be, hopefully you've had a bit of a look over. So if you if you find something that you think is incorrect, the next step is to try to figure out how you would adjust it. So having looked at mine a bit closer, I definitely think that the the overall height of the head, particularly the face, is not it's not tall enough. So it feels too squat. It's quite long his face from the sort of bottom of the beard little mark that I have in there. I also had a look at something that's useful to look for is where I've placed the ear on this right hand side, um, the sort of the the width placement of it seems quite good in terms of the sort of how it how it would angle down into that beard. Um, this beard might angle back in a little bit more. It's not too bad the height of that ear. Uh, sorry, not the height, but the width, like where it's placed horizontally. But where it seems slightly off is it seems too high up the face. So when I look at his ear here, particularly against this sort of high point where his hair is parted, mine sits too close to that, it's too high up, too far away from the beard. So one way to sort of correct the distancing between the ear and the that parting of the hair and also increase the height of the head is to just lift the, the that forehead line. So I'm not changing the line, I'm using what I have. but I'm just lifting it up a little bit. And then I'll just go in and erase that previous forehead line that I had. Now doing that has then made this hair too squashed in, so then I'm gonna to have to lift the hair up as a cons consequence. But again, it's not too complex, it's just kind of lifting that line there. I'm actually going to modify the shape slightly at the same time. Maybe not that quite that high actually. So I'll raise that all back. Probably about there's not too bad. Again drop that down. It's okay if your brush strokes end up quite smudgy like this. A smudgy brush stroke is not actually too problematic because it's like you're not quite committing to a particular sort of placement. Um, and it gives your eye a little bit of flexibility in terms of where you'll then place the kind of the confident line over the top. So don't worry too much. It's sort of beneficial in a lot of ways to, um, to use sort of quite smudgy lines at this stage and allow things to go quite sort of ghosty. Um, because as we start to build over the top, we can become more certain, more definite about our placement of darker tones. So that definitely seems a lot better in terms of overall sort of height of the light part of the face. Though it does lead me to want to correct the, his little beard at the jawline here a bit. Seems pretty good. So altering that then makes me think I need to lift this shoulder a bit. 
again, I don't even need to necessarily um, erase that. I can just kind of extend that line down a little bit quickly. So I just added a tiny little bit of burnt umber into my paint. I was kind of running out. You'll get to a point sometimes where there's just not enough paint mixed in with your, your medium to even make a decent mark. So just change the shape of the ear a little bit there. So I'm happy with that overall boundary. Can wipe that back a little bit just for now. And then yeah, with that in place, I'd be reasonably confident now to just go in and we're going to plot um, approximate placements of the um, the sort of angle of the features of the face and the where they sit, the height they sit. So the first thing I want to pop in is the top of the brow. So again, I'm thinking about that tilt, always keeping that tilt. I'm just going to pop a sort of soft straight line. Just roughly running. It needs to run a little bit higher than this ear, so I want it to run kind of sort of across there. It's pretty good. Underneath that, I'm going to put a little line in for the center of the eyes. So I've now got my sort of brow line, center of the eyes. Um, I then want my placement of my nose. So the nose sits a little bit underneath the bottom of the ear, which is about here. So the nose sits about there, sort of midway between the bottom of the um, his beard and the and the brow. So that's quite easy to place in. That one I'm just going to put a little sort of smudgy shape for now, something like that, sufficient. Maybe ever so slightly higher up than that. And the placement is sort of the, we're thinking about the base of the nose where the nose is sort of sticking out from. And then below that, I want the mouth. Now the mouth in this one, so we're kind of marking to the bottom, bottom of the beard here, which is extending the face down a little bit. His actual chin sort of sits about there. So if the nose is sort of midway between those two points, his mouth is a lot closer to his nose than to his chin. Um, this varies quite a lot from person to person, the placement of the nose. But generally it's just um, trying to clean that, clean that up a little bit. Um, and one actually, so quickly, I'll just show you something. So I was having trouble wiping that nose back because it's so small. One thing you can do to clean, another thing you can do is if you take a clean brush, I've got my clean little brush here, you can sort of use that as a cleaning device as well. Sometimes it might load a little bit too much paint onto the uh, medium, but basically I just dipped it in some medium and you can kind of use that to wipe stuff back. So say I wanted to wipe this, again, that sort of wipes things a little bit. So it's just another little device for taking paint off basically. And then you can give it a little wipe on your extra paper towel. So I've got my, my nose in place and I want to put the mouth. So the mouth is closer to the, the nose than the, than the chin. It's made him look slightly like he's smiling there, but that's approximately the right placement. So I'm fairly happy with that. So now I've got the mouth in the nose and I'll put a little bit of a note just for the center line of the head. So where the, where the sort of center is coming from the forehead, which is about that lock of hair that's spinning up and then where it runs through the center of the nose, center of the mouth. Just a slight curve to it. Something like that. So with that, we've got our rough sort of block in, very, very rough block in of the overall kind of envelope proportions of the head um, and the features, placement of the features of the, the face. So I want you to make sure you're roughly sort of up to speed with that. Um, 
I'm going to give you a little bit of time to catch up. I don't actually have a um, full tutored student today. So if I do move on too quickly, let me know. Usually that slows me down a bit and gives people time to work. Um, but I'll try to kind of keep it fairly gradual. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to start sort of thinking a bit about the shapes of the, um, the drapery, so nothing too drastic, um, and place them in. The next stage will be putting in shadow shapes. Um, and if, if you ever have any questions as well while we're working, feel free to pop them in the group chat. So the next thing we're going to be working on is starting to place very rough, um, sort of very quite basic shapes um, as shadows. So we're not going in for any detail yet. We're never truly going in for detail with the wash drawing because it is by nature more of a sketch. Um, but what we want to start thinking about now is which parts of the face are receiving, and the hair and the drapery, are receiving direct light and which parts aren't. Um, so it's a very strong, nicely lit piece, this. We've got the highlight is on the forehead. We don't have to worry too much about highlights um, because this is a wash drawing. So we're, we're just going to be limited to the lightest thing we have is going to be the, um, the, the, the tone of the panel. So if you're working, if you're working on a white panel, um, <clears throat> then that's going to be your whitest tone, which does give you a bit more range. Um, but if you're working on a, a tone panel like this, it's going to be the lightest thing we have is going to be the, the tone of the panel because all we can do is get darker with the, the, the uh, burnt umber. As a quick aside, actually, something that I was thinking of earlier when I was talking about the materials, if you are working over white um, using a white panel, um, that's not an unconventional way to do a, a wash drawing. So say you have a circumstance where you have to do a painting that day, <laughs> whatever the circumstance that might be, <clears throat> maybe you have to do a painting that day and you don't have a toned panel to do something like this. Um, a good sort of first session with something like a portrait painting or anything that's going to be representational and detailed is to just work this way over white. So you work in something like burnt umber, a fairly dark tone over your white canvas. You then get your wash drawing down just like we are right now. You allow that to dry. And then you can do a wash of whatever your tone is going to be over the top of that, but quite transparently. So you'd use a lot of mineral spirits mixed into your paint. So let's say you had white canvas, you paint on it in burnt umber. You could then use raw umber, which is a bit grayer than burnt umber. And it's a little bit more of a yellow shift to it, green yellow shift. You could use that thinly washed over the burnt umber under drawing or wash drawing. The, the wash drawing will still show through the burnt umber. So then you still have essentially the same thing that you're creating here. It's just, you're doing it the other way around. Um, but it makes use of the transparency of oil paint and it does allow you to kind of, um, sort of still work over a white canvas in a way that essentially ends up the same as doing something like this. So getting back to our shadows. Again, I'm just going to take a little bit of paint. You see how little paint we're using at the moment. Mix that into the, the mineral spirits that I have sitting on my panel, or on my palette. And what I want to start doing first, or basically now, is finding the portions of the head that are in, in shadow. So it's very strong, I mean, particularly in my, um, looking at my video, as you can see, it's very strong, that light shadow pattern on his face and the light pattern on the, the neck. Everything else is a shadow. 
we are going to spend a little bit of time sort of separating out the background from the darkest portions of his hair and the drapery. So the, the background is going to be kind of like almost as dark as it can go, but not quite as dark as pure burnt umber. Just so we have a suggestion of the the sort of the darker shadows against the lighter shadows. But for now, we're just focusing on basically finding where the, the shadow shapes are and where the light shapes are. So I would start at the top of his head. So working my way sort of down from there and using our drawing underneath as a guide. So I know this is the top, I know that this is the top of my brow and I know that this is the hairline that I've already blocked in. So I can use that to kind of gradually work my way around, starting to add a few more directional changes. Some of the hair is in light. So from this point here, that center point of his uh, sort of hair, there's this big lock that swells up. On the left side of that is a shadow. And then on the right hand side of it, it's more light. There are a few little shadows, but for now we'll just separate it out into sort of on this side of the curve, we've got a shadow. And then that drops down. <clears throat> For the time being, I'm just going to merge the shadows together on this face. So then we've got the brow slopes in quite, quite angrily towards the, that center line. Then little notch that drops down where the bridge of the nose is, cuts back across. We're being really accurate. We've got that little kind of wedge shape. <clears throat> then his lower lid is sort of semi and light. So we'll try to capture that still using this giant brush. So it could, it's probably a bit challenging, but it's very good practice to try to limit yourself to a really big brush early on in the painting. It'll just encourage you to do a lot bolder brush strokes, even if it's hard, can be difficult <clears throat> to wield it right at the beginning. So then we've got our cheek and shadow that drops down to the corner of the mouth there. So that makes that corner of the mouth. And you see, I'm kind of going from landmark to landmark, things that I've already figured out the placement of. I'm using those as my kind of guidance. So I'm not sort of stabbing around blindly trying to place all these shadows. I'm using those little notes. That's, that's the usefulness of what we've already noted down. So then we've got, I'll try to keep this quite simple. That shadow down the left-hand side of the nose. Shadow at the bottom of the nose. And then sort of merges in with the top lip. So that can all sort of merge together for the time being. <clears throat> We've then got Shadow down the left hand side of the mouth. Little shadow running across from there. Tiny little light shape above the beard. But then the beard, because it's quite dark locally, so the actual color of the beard's quite dark, I'm going to merge that in with the shadows. So that sort of runs its way up here. I can connect that in. So roughly that's the outside of those shadow shapes. I just want to really quickly, I'm going to pop, sort of wash a tone into them. So again, still using these, this big brush. So 
So I'm just pretty much filling in the lines that I've already plotted out. <clears throat> it's got all those shadows in place. Um, probably it's it's a good idea. I can just lose that that beard. We'll find that again later. I'm going to pop in some shadows, suggestions of shadows for the drapery as well at this stage, kind of merge them together. So it's mostly this sort of cast shadow that runs over his shoulder. That color is very much in light. A few little shadows there, some little notes that run down there. But that's not too bad. So working our way across the face now, I then want to try to get this as well as possible capture the shape of this, this other eye. So again, he's got a pretty severe expression. not too bad for that eye. So then moving across again, got the sideburn, which is dark, not necessarily in shadow, but it's dark locally. Then above the, keep the ear in light for the time being, we'll go back and figure that out. The hair back here is pretty much just lost into the background. So we'll allow that to be lost. That will just merge in. So that's called a lost edge. So even though we know that there's going to be hair there, we're just going to merge it where we can't actually see a difference. Where we start to see more light is these little strands of hair on the left hand, right hand side of his head. Um, there's also a little bit of a suggestion, a sort of note of sweeping hair sort of down here, you can see. Then back up near that parting, that there's another shadow again, so we want that. That drops down, merges in with the, the background. And the background sort of starts to cut in here and there, around the top of his hair. A dark note up there and we can start to just sort of wash over and darken generally these shadows as they meet. And sort of wash our way down. So this is something we're going to be starting to do now. So you can see starting to spread that paint, that small amount of paint that I had up there, spread it around and sort of even it out. Starts to give us a bit more control over our tones. So because we've got everything plotted in, um, that's what we're going to be doing now and for the rest of the, the session. I recommend if you've got your um, sort of construction lines, if you can, if they're not dried too much, just remove them anywhere where they're 
of impeding a section that's just going to be pure light. Something like that's what we want just for our kind of initial block in. And we're going to be working, this is the basis that we kind of carry on the uh, the rest of the drawing. So generally, if you sort of blow your eyes, you can see we need to go a lot darker. Obviously, the, the painting's not going to go as dark as um, the original because that's black, but we have a lot of space. So somewhere down here, we know that's going to be pure burnt umber. You know, that's how dark we can go with it. So we can sort of start to work up from sort of work between what we know as our kind of mid tones in the shadows and kind of gradually where necessary start to add darker tones with the, uh, the pure burnt umber. And that's how we're going to end up with a, a fairly effective monochrome. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of time again to catch up. Just a few minutes. Um, for this stage, if you just to make it a bit easier to be sure about your lines, if you take your smaller brush and what I want you to do is just go through and neaten out some of these, the edges of the shadows. So we're pretty confident about the placement of them, but we can go a bit more specific with their shapes using this darker tone. So around this ear, for instance. And again, from there, we'll be able to just kind of fill in the dark tones.
So you can see, I had this sort of lighter tone a bit higher up there, but the shape wasn't quite right. So I dropped it down slightly as I was correcting it. So I'm sort of using that smudginess, that kind of not totally sort of total clarity yet. Um, quality that it has to make sort of just ever so slight corrections as where as we progress. Another thing to note, so something I just noticed, um, it can be useful when you're copying shapes to sort of think about things in a, a more abstract way. So rather than thinking about this being his ear and the side of the hair and so on, um, try to turn the shape that you're looking at into something, something in its own right. So just something that stood out here is this little shape that I've drawn in looks a bit like a dog snout with some ears poking up and it's sort of arms reaching forward there, maybe like a Scotty dog or something almost like that it looks. So if I start to look at that shape and I can see it in the original as well, it's a bit dark on my, my video, but you should be able to see it in yours. That shape around the ear moving up into the, the, um, the hair, to me definitely reads as a sort of like dog in profile and particularly like a sort of more of a Scotty dog shape. So if I start to think of it like that, rather than being an ear and hair and so forth, it's a lot easier to be accurate with that shape as I can see if it seems too wide or um, if it seems too squashed and so forth. So try to use that as a good little trick to use. Then as I drop down here, we've got this dark shape just cuts ever so slightly into the collar, which is an important little detail. Then the rest of it wraps around the back of this collar. Cuts in slightly. And drops down again. Drops down to about that point before breaking off. There's a ever so slightly lighter gray. So I don't want to go super dark with that, but the color that's kind of the white bit of the color right next to that is pretty much pure dark. But for now I can leave that and just work my way across where I know it's a lot darker. <clears throat> so I know that goes dark up to here, cuts back across, there's that hair that sticks out. That definitely connects to this point here, where the hair, the parting of the hair is. Wraps over, over about there. And then the original sort of cuts off about here, which can make it a little bit difficult to judge things. We've got this, this little shape up there. This darker brushstroke that drops down. Sort of merges in. Then it's sort of at about this point where it starts to get lighter. So from Knowing that that's what we're going to do, we can now go in with, back in with the bigger brush and just really darken this as much as possible, pretty much as much as possible. We'll probably do another little pass over it, as I say, right at the end. So this stage, I can go back to my bigger brush.
As I say, up until about this point, it's pretty much pure pure burnt umber. But beyond this point, it starts to lighten off a little bit. <clears throat> so what I want you to do is, in the background, so before we get into the trickier bits in the face, just try to practice making it get sort of gradually, just gradually lighter. And try to also hit approximately the sort of relative value. So, you know, how much lighter is this left, right, left hand side of the face versus the right hand side? You can start to almost dry brush it on at this stage is useful. Your paint should be getting a little bit sort of stickier, so it shouldn't be too hard to dry brush it. And once you drop down to this uh, hair on the left hand side, we want to go back with really thick paint. Actually, what we'll do is we'll do the same thing. We'll outline using our smaller brush, the approximate shape of it. Because this hair is going to be um, back to being sort of pure burnt umber, but the background behind it is slightly lighter. So where the hair was merging in with the background on this right hand side, um, the hair is standing a little bit, sort of sits a little bit darker and darker than the, uh, the background behind it. a tiny bit so that little bit of the um, sideburn that we see on the left hand side is also quite dark but so the hair is dark but then once we get to the skin we've got this reflected light so we don't want to go totally dark there we want to keep that separate so we can separate out that sort of temple of the forehead So now we've got that hair outline, we can go back in with the big brush. And get that fairly thickly painted on. While we're at it, actually, because we've already kind of roughly got it in place, this color also is pretty much as dark as it goes. So a little bit of figuring out where the, the beard shapes are, but they're quite simple. So they sit about here.
right there. Just go, I'm just going to go a little bit darker with this collar here. And also just the hair right in the center. Just about running out of my burnt umber, so I'm going to put a little bit more out soon. Just going to make sure that's as dark as it can be. So I'm going to pop some more. Burnt umber out. Also just going to adjust my exposure a little bit. I think it might have got a bit darker. If I can get it about to the right level. Yeah, I'll lock it in about there. And just I'll just check my focus as well. It's not too bad. And then I'm just going to dim. Yeah, that seems about right. I just wanted you to be able to see into the, the shadow sufficiently. So we'll carry on now with that background. So we're still trying to work out, work this background sort of behind. It's quite good. So you can see those brush strokes are starting to sort of slightly smudge into each other. That's actually a good thing because these sort of like shadows where the, the hair's meeting the, the background in shadow. They can actually do with being a little bit sort of smudgier and in less defined or less sharp um, because that's what they're like in the painting and it it exaggerates the sense of separation or sort of the, the sense that the background is receding into the, the shadows in the background are receding away from the, the central part of the painting, which is the, the face and light. So having soft edges like that is no bad thing at all. If you find that the kind of messing around with it starts to alter the shape, you can go back in with your thicker paint. With your bigger brush. You could also, if you need some sort of slightly more crisp specific uh, edges, you can go in with your small brush, which will tend to be a bit better at doing that sort of thing. The bigger bristle is going to always kind of make things a bit smudgier. So between the two of them, you should start to get a reasonable amount of control of your, your brushwork. So I can also go down at this point and start to scrub in the sort of dark tones of the drapery, which aren't quite shadows. So we've already got these few of these shadows in place, so we can make them kind of out them a little, outline them a little bit darker with the smaller brush to just keep a note of them. But the rest of the drapery is going to go pretty dark as well. You know, it's a, it's actually a darker value, I would say, than the um, the background behind. Not quite as dark as the sort of the darkest bits of the painting, but pretty dark nonetheless. 
So again, this is a good place to kind of practice your your application of brush strokes. It can be a little bit looser in with things like drapery. When we get back up to the face, it's, we're going to have to sort of be a bit more tight with what we're doing. And you can try different sort of types of applications. So you can go sort of mix a lot more mineral spirits in, get more of a kind of washy effect. Um, you can wipe that off and then go more dry brushy again. But hopefully you're enjoying the sort of effects you start to just naturally develop. It's a good way to kind of just get familiar with um, how oil painting feels, the particular kind of qualities of oil paint, just because there's so few variables that can sort of go wrong or get away from you, which I think is usually what people really struggle with in oil paint. So that's not too bad for our darkest tones, <clears throat> at least the darkest tones in the, the background. It's good to start with the background just because it's a bit more forgiving than the face. Not that we can't make adjustments, but um, it's just a good way to kind of get familiar with the brushwork. And kind of carry on with this process of working gradually towards the center, towards the, the face. Um, we want to start laying in, if we kind of blur our eyes, you can see that the, the hair in light is a lot darker than anything else in light. So the, the rest of the face is going to be quite bright and light. So we want to, again, similar to what we did down here with the drapery, just pop in that kind of like scrub in a, a lighter dark tone, if that makes sense. sort of wash it, wash it over. We might lose a little bit of what we have in terms of some of those shapes, but it's okay. We'll be easy to find them again. So it starts to lighten off quite a lot around this area. So if I want to just go back and kind of clean that 
I can use, I've got that, my third brush. So I'm just going to use that just to, to lift a little bit of that paint that I've blocked in. But I want to do it in quite a smudgy way because it's a fairly soft transition. So I didn't want to like totally erase it with the uh, mineral spirits just yet. 